Hi, hello again on my channel and in the same time on my scientific website discoversocialsciences.com uh, In this video you can find another piece of educational content although it is quite an amb ambitious piece of educational content uh, which I generally place in the stream labeled Urban Economics City Management. In this specific video I am uh, diving into some recent uh, literature, into some recent research, published research, as for the impact of the pandemic, as, as for the impact of COVID-19, on the way we live in cities and on the likely impact of the pandemic on cities. Uh, it goes back to like spring this year. Every time uh, I write or say something about my research as for city management, as for urban economics, I go back to that one day. I think it was the beginning of March. I was cycling through my hometown, through Kraków in Poland, during those first days of lockdown in the beginning of March. And I had, it, it was really strange, it was like a post-apocalyptic landscape. The city was on, in the middle of a working day, the city was almost completely deserted, it was empty. I have never seen my hometown even in the like in the deepest times of communism in the 1970s i have never seen it th that empty and it was then that i had that strange question that popped in my mind how many human footsteps do we need to keep that city working and really to keep that city alive uh, and this is where my whole research on cities started. And in this specific video, I am passing in review some literature as regards the impact of the COVID uh, on the way that cities work. And I most specifically focus on the impact of reduced social mobility or altered social mobility. My central point in that respect is that the lockdowns, the official restrictions that, are, that have been or had been imposed in the past, then they were lifted, then we consider reintroducing them. Those official restrictions are one thing, but the durable change in behavior in us, the inhabitants of cities, is completely a, a different thing. I already noticed that both me and people whom I know, we started to modify our behavior even without any restrictions from the part of the government. We started uh, to live and function in much smaller social circles. We started to function in those circles of what, uh, which I call uh, for my own intellectual needs as the circles of knowingly healthy people. The logic is that I can observe a person for weeks and weeks if I see that they are healthy, essentially, that they have no like acute symptoms of, of COVID-19. And if I have a reasonably good, reasonably accurate knowledge about social interactions that they enter into, after some time, I can assume that, that they are like a reasonably safe social relation and I tend to stick to them. So I observe that both me and other people have drastically reduced the number of more haphazard, more accidental social interactions with people whom we don't know. There is like an instinctive push in many people to avoid crowds, to avoid large gatherings, to avoid the places and people whom we don't know or which and whom we don't know. So here I go. My hypothesis that uh, which results both from observation of empirical facts and from some historical reading that I had about past epidemics, especially in Europe, my hypothesis is that COVID-19 
has awakened in us some deeply rooted culture, uh, deeply rooted cultural patterns which date back to the times of high epidemic risk, like to those uh, like many centuries ago, to those epidemics of plague, for example. So long before vaccines, sanitation and the widespread basic health care. So we have awakened those old tigers, those old patterns in order to adapt to the current situation. And those patterns involve less spatial mobility in the population, less uh, mobility in social interactions and less social interactions with the people whom we don't know. So we have awakened or reawakened a pattern of collective behavior where we tend to maintain social interactions within relatively steady social circles of knowingly healthy people. As a result, the overall frequency of social interactions uh, in cities is likely to decrease and as a contingent result, the formation of new social roles is likely to slow down. I have that big thought, which I developed through my writing and through my videos, that cities in our civilization play the role of like factories of new social roles for new humans. So cities, is like, cities are like a factory of social diversity. It is, cities, let's say, are experimental environments which are supposed to lead to accelerated experimentation with the social roles, the social relations, skill sets, educational systems and so on. So I now go through literature, through a few articles which I found. First of all, an article uh, which is referenced here in the, in the bottom of the slide. By the way, in each slide I will place the reference to the article in question uh, at the very bottom. So this uh, specific articles which I refer to is Spread and Dynamics of the COVID-19 Epidemic in Italy Effects of Emergency Containment Measures published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And here are my takeaways. Uh, those, bullets point, uh, those bullet points above uh, are my takeaways from this article. So, testing effort and quarantining are essential components of collective defense against the pandemic. I mean, there is no way around it. And I thought that essentially quarantine is not just something imposed by the government. Quarantine is a pattern of behavior. It is a, essentially a pattern of behavior where we drastically cut down social interactions between people who are high epidemic risk on the one hand and people who are low epidemic risk on the other hand. There is that isolation which essentially can be placed on the same scale as social distancing. It is just a sharper, uh, more drastic form of social distancing. When I avoid going to a cinema theater or when I avoid going to a concert, I essentially behave around the same core pattern reduce risky social interactions and quarantine is just a development a, a big ass development on the same on, on the same core behavioral pattern so testing and quarantine are patterns of collective behavior and i and, and that pattern can be uh, can be summarized as following i check whether the people around me are carriers or not of course carriers are of the virus and then I split them into two categories, those whom I strongly suspect to host and transmit SARS-CoV-2 on the one hand and all the rest on the other hand. And accordingly, I define two patterns of social interactions with those two groups, very restrictive with the former and like cautiously bon vivant with the others. Still, we minimize hugging. As I see that testing technologies are like inevitably permitting and spreading across the social landscape, I assume that those patterns of social interaction will kind of 
tend to be more and more popular, tend to be more and more widespread, practiced and learned by trial and error. So that's the first piece of literature. The second one, an article which for a reason which I don't know uh, has been published in the Journal of Cleaner Production. Why? I don't know, search me. And uh, the title is Spatial Temporal Potential Exposure Risk Analytics and Urban Sustainability Impact Related to COVID-19 Mitigation, a Perspective from Car Mobility Behavior. And there, and there is something interesting. Essentially, it is uh, based on empirical research in Singapore. By the way, maybe I can make it slightly bigger. On empirical research in Singapore, Uh, where they found out that a decrease in the spatial in the spatial mobility of cars, a decrease which ranges between 44% and 55%, is correlated with a 72% decrease in the risk of social transmission of the virus. I intuitively translate it into a geometrical pattern. Uh, decreased spatial mobility of cars means that each average car in the city during, for example, one month covers a shorter distance. And uh, a shorter distance covered means that the average radius of mobility, the average radius of movement is lower, is smaller. So that decreased mobility in cars means that people tend to cover with the time a smaller territory in their daily or weekly activity. So each of us, at least those of us who have a car, tend to like shrink the average territory that we cover during like a work week. This is another tangible change in our behavior. Another paper, Uh, the main takeaway of which uh, I have here, each society seems to have been experimenting with the spatial mobility they can afford and sustain in the presence of epidemic risk. Uh, that thought or that takeaway comes essentially from a paper which uh, has its title here. Let me just make it more visible. COVID-19 outbreak response, a data set to access mobility changes in Italy following national lockdown. Uh, this paper is actually not a, a fully blown article. It is just a developed commentary on a data set about uh, uh, social and spatial mobility in Italy during the pandemic. So I made a quick association with a functionality that you can find with Google. I'm showing it here. At this address, Google COVID-19 mobility, you can find data as for specific countries and specific regions in some countries as regards how spatial mobility has changed or how has it has been changing since the beginning of the pandemic. You can observe it by yourself. Now what I can tell you that First of all, each country is different in that respect. It is, well, it is common sense, but uh, sometimes those differences are really, really visible. You know? Yet there is a common pattern to those idiosyncrasies. First of all, there is cyclicality. In each country, there seems to be like a three to four weeks cycle of adaptation. So you can see, for example, spatial mobility in parks going up, then going down, going up and going down. There is that sine wave movement with a cycle of approximately three to four weeks. Same with spatial mobility as regards the movement between home and the workplace. Once again, there is that wave up, down, up, down. Those wave-like changes, they show that each society is experimenting. And here, 
Experimenting means that we are collectively learning. And we are collectively learning, it is almost bound to lead to a durable behavioral change. Like there is no way around it, once again. Once humans start collectively experimenting with something, it is a one-way ticket. It is a durable, one-way behavioral change in behavior. And we are currently learning with the pandemic new ways of being together. Those new ways include like uh, nailing down the right amount of social interaction and the right amount of spatial mobility. Another uh, paper, another in interesting one, which uh, gives like a different light or on, 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 on the same uh, problem. The paper, the title of the paper is here. It was published in Science. It is the effect of human mobility and control measures on the COVID-19 epidemic in China. Now, I, first of all, I will go through the bullet points and then I will go to the title of the slide to explain you what is my train of, of thinking. So, in the paper, uh, it was written, or I could find out results, that without any restrictions in place, the spatial distribution of COVID-19 cases is strongly correlated with spatial, with spatial mobility of people. So, the more people move, the more people interact, the more infections there are. It is like straightforward right now. Spatial mobility, unrestricted spatial mobility, is like a vector, like a vehicle for the ep epidemic. When we put in place restrictions, so when we become smarter and more selective about uh, uh, moving across space and about social interactions, the correlation between infection and spatial mobility decreases. Yet it is never driven down to zero. So yes, we can nail down such patterns of social interactions, such patterns of spatial mobility, which are favorable to like stomping down the pandemic, yet there is no known form of restrictions, even the strictest ones, which could completely stop the spread of the pandemic. This is interesting. Even those restrictions in China, which if you read a little bit about it, it was really stringent, involving, for example, people being forcibly locked inside their, their residential blocks. Uh, even that didn't completely stop the spread of the epidemic. And finally, the last paper. Uh, whose or the title of which I am just putting in red and bold font. So the title of the paper uh, of the paper is Economic and Social Consequences of Human Mobility Restrictions Under COVID-19. And the basic observations are the following. High income and low inequality. Oh, I made a mistake. High income and low inequality communities have the greatest capacity to sustain the adverse economic impact of social restrictions for epidemic safety. So they can adapt the most deeply. Uh, as income decreases and inequality rises, uh, the capacity to sustain uh, social restrictions decreases. So at the other end of the spectrum, the poorest or the most unequal local communities have the lowest capacity to adapt socially to the pandemic. Uh, my takeaway from that is that on the long run, first of all, on the long run, economic resilience counts, matters in our social, in our social response to pandemic. Uh, that social change that I'm talking that I'm talking about, the durable behavioral change like that drift towards uh, 
living and working in relatively small closed social circles of knowingly healthy people. That change is likely to be the deepest in relatively wealthy uh, local communities and wealthy with low inequality in wealth. Those ones are going to adapt the deepest and as those communities become poorer and as though and, and as they become marked more and more by in, by economic inequality the capacity to perform that deep social change is likely to be reduced so my provisional conclusions like to sum up all that uh, all that lot of a little bit uncombed thinking First of all, we do modify, as a species, our social patterns towards more encapsulated social circles. Secondly, there is a process of learning taking place and it involves a downwards recalibration in the average territory of activity, as well as a smart selection of people whom we hang out with, based on what we know about the epidemic risk they convey. And thirdly, income and accumulated capital visibly give local communities an additional edge in that adaptive learning. On the long run, economic resilience uh, seems to be a key factor in successful adaptation to epidemic risk. Okay, that would be all in that video. Uh, once again, I wish all of you to have fun with science and to have fun with life. Bye.